Hey, Renter Retires, it's Adam Schrader here, and I am once again joined by the man, the myth, the legend, the founder and CEO of Rent to Retirement, Zach Lamaster. And we are pleased today to be joined by guest uh, Paul Moore. He is the managing partner at Wellings Capital, as well as the author of uh, books like The Perfect Investment, Create Enduring Wealth from the Historic Shift to Multifamily Housing. And he's got a new book that is Storing Up Profits, Capitalize on America's Obsession with Stuff by investing in self-storage. So we'll dive into that a little bit. Um, I don't know about everybody else out there, but looking around my house, there's definitely a lot of stuff. So Paul, thanks for joining us today. Hey, it's great to be here, guys. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we always like to start by just learning about uh, your journey, kind of how you got started in real estate and kind of what you um, went through to get where you are today. All right. Well, I, you know, I sold my company to a publicly traded firm almost 25 years ago. And I thought I'm a full-time investor now. And I thought that that sounded pretty cool. But what I found out was I wasn't a full-time investor. I was a full-time speculator and I made a lot of mistakes, uh, made some money, lost a lot of money as well along the way. And I, so I went through years of doing stupid stuff, uh, I also uh, flipped a bunch of houses, flipped a bunch of waterfront lots at a resort called Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia, um, built seven or eight houses, did a subdivision. And I always wondered how to get involved in commercial real estate, but I wasn't sure where the on-ramp was uh, until we ended up building a multifamily asset and then operating that for a number of years in North Dakota. So that's what got me in in 2011. North Dakota. What part of North Dakota? We were in uh, the area. We we did a hotel in Minot, and then we did um, um, a lot of uh, hotel quasi multifamily around uh, Watford City and Williston during the oil boom. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I was I was stationed in Grand Forks, and oh yeah, that's where we started investing was North Dakota. But yeah, very cool. Yeah. How did you go from you know you were talking East Coast, and now you're talking um, you know, you know, how, how would you yeah. move around? I had a petroleum engineering degree before I got out of school that I was a most of a waste. And, uh, but <laughs> I thought I knew enough to invest in an oil and gas deal in the Bakken in North Dakota. So I invested in that. And my buddy, my business partner for many years had a small jet and he could never find a place to stay. So he, and we had to keep flying back out of North Dakota to find a hotel room for the night. And we said, hey, we know what we're doing. We're, we're real smart. We, we, why don't we build uh, some housing for these oil workers? And we hit the ground running and did that in a short time. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, the boom of anyone that's familiar with Williston, I mean, it's just great, crazy, crazy stories. And uh, okay. then, you know, at one point that went, that went away. But, um, right. you know, it's, it's interesting. You have this, this story of like, man, sold privately or publicly trade company and like it's like you just and then put that money i love that you said speculator because what it sounds like is now you have this money that you're putting in these different avenues right and you're trying to kind of see what what works and, and what doesn't and of course uh, through that period of time you know just as most of us have lost some money and made some and you know learned what um what you want to really focus on which it sounds like is more transition into some of these commercial assets. And so it's at the first property you built in the commercial space was, uh, well, you built it, right? So you, you weren't mm -hmm. uh, buying any commercial assets. So that was the first one you, you broke into right. the commercial space with. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And so then you thought, let's go simple, right? Yeah, right. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool. You've, you've done a lot clearly. Um, and, and I think there's a lot we really want to unpack with you, but I, I kind of actually want to go through more into the asset classes. You, you have this, you know, barrage of different stuff you've done, but you've ne now at this point in time, you've really focused in on self storage as, as well as I believe, um, you know, mobile home parks. But yeah. can we talk a little bit about just like the why, like why those asset classes? Yeah, absolutely. So my dear wife was sick and tired of me chasing shiny objects. And, you know, when I wrote the perfect investment, part of that, you know, title was a stake in the ground saying, this is it. I found it. This is, I'm not going to do anything <laughs> else, but multifamily for the rest of my life. And, you know, honestly, part of the problem that arose in the next four or five years was we had a terrible acquisition team. I'll, I'll admit that. 
part of the problem too was we started looking at the apartment deals we were seeing at least. And again, part of it was our poor team, but uh, the deals we were seeing were so overpriced that they were back in the speculation realm. And we felt like, well, wait a minute, I was trying to get away from speculation. I didn't want to do that anymore. And so finally we got really frustrated and decided to look for assets that were largely owned by mom and pop operators. You know, these are the folks that are doing really, really well, cash flowing typically, but they don't have the desire or knowledge or resources to upgrade their asset, to increase net income and therefore maximize shareholder value. And so paying these mom and pop operators full fair price uh, gave us an opportunity to go in and significantly improve these and, you know, sometimes you know, raise the income within a year by 40 or 50%, therefore raising the value by the same amount and raising the equity value by, you know, maybe 100% in a year. And that's very, very common in self-storage, mobile home parks, uh, maybe in two years in an RV park. So that's why we like those asset classes. So huge value add opportunity is what mm -hmm. I'm hearing. And really the, the strategy here is you have an operator that you know maybe maybe it's operated quite successfully for, right. for many years um but there's just that upside potential that hey you got to put some more work into it put some money into it increase those rents right um you know maybe decrease expenses and have some better operations and that's really the value add and a lot of people just hey they've it's been good for them for many years they're not going to do that yeah. um was there any seller financing involved in that i mean i'm just curious a lot of times we'll see that scenario yeah. play out for people but yeah, it's funny. A lot of the smaller and older owned mobile home parks, they think that the they still think that the only type of financing available is seller financing. So they're ready to do that. Uh, sometimes that comes into play. Sometimes you know you swoop in with a cash offer because they're in real distress. Like these five kids I saw, you know, who were, their parents had sadly passed away and they owned a self storage facility. These five kids were running it, even though it was a large facility, they were running it into the ground. And, you know, uh, our app, our operating partner acquired it for 2.4 million and, uh, literally in just three and a half months had an appraisal for 4.6 million, he bought it for cash, put 2 million in debt on it after the appraisal that would have been an 83% LT, you know, loan to cost, but it turned out to be an 43% loan to value loan, much, much safer when we, with that new value. And so that was, you know, that kind of scenario is quite typical. Well, that's interesting. And I guess, yeah, it's one thing I've heard too, is if you have different uh, owners that have had a property for a while and sometimes even maybe they're not really distressed, but just like an exit strategy for them is, you know, they, they don't want this huge, this huge lump of sum of capital right. and paying taxes on it. This is like, okay, they've done well and now they want to ride, ride through the rest of their retirement, just getting paid for that over time. So right. yeah. that's some opportunity, but that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I kind of look at that deal you just explained is really applicable to, I mean, that's self-storage, but I mean, that could be very applicable to just a house, right? I mean, yeah, it's the right. same, same type of story in the inherent inheritance. I want to just ask this more on the personal level. Um, when you talked about buy, being speculative and buying properties that are over overvalued um, and maybe that was in the multifamily space, I don't, I don't know. Could you, could you expand on that? Like what, what that really means? Are you buying like off the market or just like a typical cap rate on market deals? Or what, what do you mean by being speculative in that, yeah. in that regard? Yeah, I feel like investing is when your principal is generally safe with a margin of safety and you've got a chance to make a return. And speculation is when your principal is not at all safe and you've got a chance to make a return. A lot of times, investing, you know, in the investing realm, we've got more of the, you know, assets that are already cash flowing, uh, assets that are already, you know, have a safe, healthy debt service coverage ratio, or can at least get one pretty quickly. Uh, and speculation like the oil and gas deal I did in North Dakota, you know, there's no cash flow and there's a chance there never will be. Of course, you're rolling the dice, hoping it'll be a hundred X, but sometimes it turns out zero like ours did. <laughs> did you find yourself you know with the recent run-up that we've experienced um having to go during the covid time to slightly more speculative speculative or have you been able to keep that deal flow pretty constant uh, and not as speculative during that time yeah so i will honestly tell you that i felt in the spring of 2020 and through the summer 
we just didn't know what we didn't know, right? And so I thought that a lot of what we were doing was speculative. For example, I thought, what if they put an eviction moratorium on mobile home parks, on, on mobile homes, and they say, they don't, these people don't have to pay and you can't kick them out. Well, all of a sudden, your very safe cash flowing investment seems like it's not. And But I'll, I'll tell you, after that brief fear you know, moment of about four months, we found that, you know, really uh, everything was normal for us again. And, and self-storage came roaring out of uh, COVID. Uh, Wall Street Journal and New York Times both did articles in the fall last year saying they came out as the top performing commercial asset class. Uh, you guys have probably heard that RV parks are just going incredible. I mean, just amazing numbers from RV parks as well and mobile home parks. I mean, there really is a housing, affordable housing crisis. 10,000 people turn 65 daily, about 4,000 of them, uh, four of the 10,000 have even $10,000 saved for retirement. And uh, these people need a place to live. And a lot of them are turning to mobile home parks and other manufactured housing. A lot, a lot I want to unpack there and dive deeper into. Um, since we talked about COVID, you know, a couple of years ago and that, that history, what What's happening right now in in your um, viewpoint in the asset classes that you're you're looking at, Paul? I mean, what what? How should we be viewing the next couple of years and in investing in real estate in general? Hmm. Well, I think it's more important than ever right now to again find these assets that have tremendous intrinsic value. You know, that have uh, that have much more potential value to tap into and harvest than is than meets the eye. And these are typically, you know, from mom and pop sellers. And we get a lot of those in self, self storage, many more percentage wise in mobile home parks and RV parks. And so uh, we really feel like that's, you know, really, really important. I mean, when you can get an asset like the one I talked to you about a few minutes ago that almost doubles in value um, in a short time, you know, that's offsetting a whole lot of interest rate risk. I think there is very real interest rate risk. And I think a lot of folks who got these very, you know, variable floating rate loans that, you know, that where they're barely covering the debt service, if at all, are, are going to be at real risk. And I think it's a better time than ever to be really, really careful about what you're investing in. So when you talk about interest rate risk, um, you, you did make the point of people that have I mean, that are subject to variability, right? With things changing. If, if we go up another three or four points, that could dramatically change yeah. the, the cash flow setting. So, yeah. Um, all right. No, I mean, that's it. You know, no one's got a crystal ball, but I mean, right. definitely underwriting the, the fundamentals of real estate as you always should be, I, I think is really a key point as well. But having that, the value add opportunity, I mean, that's just, that's the space that you work in. Can we right. unpack, um, can we unpack uh, the self storage a little bit more on like the operational side? So obviously there's mm -hmm. an opportunity to, you know, have maybe an easily, I guess, rather easily find some, you know, just mom, pa owner undervalued property, just based on, you know, poor management or mm -hmm. under, you know, things like that, that can be increased rather quickly. But I mean, what, what is, what else is it about self storage that really makes it a, a great asset class and how are you underwriting and evaluating these deals? Is it simply on mm -hmm. market comps and, um, P and L's and, and things like that and implementing your, your own systems or. Yeah. Um, so there are about 53,000 self storage facilities in the U S which is about the same as Nike or Nike. What am I saying? McDonald's, Starbucks, and Subway combined. I'm combining another analogy there, I think. And, um, but 75% of them are owned by independent operators and two out of every three of those are mom and pops with one asset only. And like I said, these folks typically don't maximize the value and cash flow. And so I, when I first heard about self-storage and somebody mentioned value add self-storage, I think I laughed out loud. I mean, where's the value? We're talking about four pieces of sheet metal, some rivets, a floor, and a door. You know, what do you do? Sweep it out between tenants. Okay, <laughs> great. Where's the, where's the upgraded appliances and lighting and flooring and, you know, dog park and all that? Well, there are a lot of value adds in self-storage. In fact, I identified about a dozen big ones in my book. Uh, there are things like, I mean, we uh, invested in one in Grand Junction, Colorado, 
that had 80% occupancy, the norm full, normal full is about 90, let's say. So they were, you know, double the vacancy they should have, but more significantly, they had 80% delinquency. And the cool thing about self-storage is it's very easy to fix delinquency. I mean, we don't have to go into the details of that right now, but I'll tell you, we're leveraging their stuff. And so, and there's no eviction moratorium on self-storage, right? So it's pretty easy to fix. So that's, that's one. A lot of them have low rents. Their goal is to stay 100% full. They don't want to do any marketing. That's great. Adding marketing and raising rents by, to the market level. Sometimes you can raise rents. Uh, I can, I'm thinking of one in Florida we invested in last month, 24% in one month rent increase. Another one, 36% over two months. Um, so rent increases. Another one is uh, adding a showroom with, you know, selling retail items like locks, hmm, boxes, tape, scissors, um, adding U-Haul, getting a contract with U-Haul. Yep. You can produce anywhere from a couple thousand a month up to even 10 or 15,000 a month. Now that's not the norm. The norm would be two or 3,000 a month in commission. Take, let's say it's 3,000 a month. That's 36,000 a year. 36,000 a year, use our little math formula for commercial real estate, divide the increased income divided by the cap rate, let's say 6% to be conservative, 36,000 a year by 6%, you're adding $600,000 to the value of that facility just by setting up U-Haul rentals and you know implementing that. There's no CapEx, there's no big cost to that. It's just a little bit of hassle. And you actually increase your occupancy by 5% on average by doing that as well. And so lots of wonderful value adds, uh, including boat and RV storage, uh, adding a propane filling station, adding an ATM, adding a billboard. I'd never seen this done, but I would think you could add a cell tower sometimes. Lots of fun value adds. Paul, now, when you talk you about... Uh... Do you mind repeating that list for me real quick? I'm trying to say. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, really? just kidding. Read, read your book, right? I mean, that's what yes, we got to do. Yes, you need to read my book. <laughs> no, that's, I'm just, you got my wheels turning here because you said some super creative things that, uh, you know, are, are, seem like rather easy implementation. Yeah. But Adam, yeah, I interrupted are. you. Go ahead. <laughs> when you talked about, you know, no eviction moratoriums on uh, the self-storage, when you look at markets, is there... Do you, do you stick with, you know, the areas that are good for investors, like of single family and multifamily where, you know, there are, you know, landlord friendly rules or is it kind of just everywhere is fairly landlord friendly? Because if they break their lease, you can yeah. you know, put them on storage wars and suddenly, yeah. I don't even know if that's still a show anymore, but, you know, get their stuff out. Yeah, we've, um, so I had a lot of rules when we were doing multifamily syndication for where we would or wouldn't buy, but self-storage, I mean, that deal I told you about earlier, uh, it was in Beeville, Texas, population 12,000. We have another huge self-storage deal. It still blows my mind. In Ishpeming, Michigan, 160,000 square feet, which is like 60,000, 60% larger, 60,000 square feet larger than those big ones you usually see. It's a population 3,500, but there's a regional, you know, a draw for a place like that. So yeah, the, the I mean, even in California, self storage works well. Uh, I'm not saying there couldn't be eviction moratorium someday, but at this point, there's not. Um, let's uh, a couple of questions I have is just on the operational side with with self storage. Are you typically when you're acquiring these? Um, I guess a, a, few, a few questions would be just in general as we try to kind of unpack this asset class. What, you typically have an operational team. I mean, what does your team look like that's that's operating? Do you have boots on the ground? Does it depend on the size of the facility um, that's managing the property? What does that look like? Uh, and, and what does debt look like on, on self storage? Yeah, so debt is very similar to apartments. It's uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, agency debts available. CMBS is also available. Um, typical, you know, LTV, LTC would be 65 to 75%, similar to multifamily debt constrained in the same way with, you know, 1.2 or higher debt service coverage ratio. Um, as far as operations, just to be clear, we, we strategized, we pivoted about four years ago and decided to be a, um, 
fund manager. And so we do not operate any of the assets we're talking about. But the way the operations work, I mean, you know, self-storage, depending on the size, might have some of them are automated and some of the medium sized self-storage now are automated with a new technology. But typically you have one to three employees at a self-storage uh, in a mobile home park, one employee, a very large one, maybe one plus a maintenance person. Um, RV parks, interestingly, these uh, destination RV parks that we're investing in have a hundred employees in the summer, amazingly. But uh, yeah, there's a property management team, typical regional property manager, just like with apartments, and then local property management team. That's very cool. We had, um, as, as I'm kind of thinking about this, like one, one potential value add, I would think, would even be just the simple automation factor of it and reducing your yeah. overhead employee costs, uh, which can be dramatic sometimes. There was, we interviewed Kevin Bupp, who's another oh, yeah. um, guy, you probably get familiar with him in the space, but he was telling stories about um, auto, parking lot automation mm -hmm. and uh, replacing ten, the uh, parking lot attendance with um, just meters and then yeah. also having dynamic meter so that was kind of interesting how, how are mm -hmm. you finding a lot of these deals paul is is finding well you know, now you're operating on the fund manager side but i mean when you're when you're looking for an undervalued type mm -hmm. of um storage facility is this a lot just like your you know direct marketing cold calling broker relationships what do you yeah mean? uh 95 percent of these deals are off market so it's not through brokers um the best uh, acquisition team that we know of has seven or eight people working the phones, text, email full time. So 40 hours a week, seven or eight people calling through a list of 44,000 mobile home park owners and 53,000 self storage uh, owners. Of course, they're not calling everyone, but they're calling the non institutional owners of those assets. And, you know, they're texting them, calling them, staying in touch, emailing them. I mean, one situation in Michigan, the uh, uh, guy they called, he was 88 years old owning, he ran a large mobile home park and they called him quarterly for seven years. And when he was 95, his niece called them and said, hey, he's right here. He's ready to sell. Finally, we'll just take that offer you made two or three years ago. Uh, <laughs> and uh that and, and my operating partner said, well, that was kind of a low offer for now. She said, ah, what's he going to do with the money anyway? It's fine. So <laughs> I mean, I'm surprised he said anything after that. It's just, okay. Uh, we'll right. send you the contract. I know. Um, no, that, that's so cool. And I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's just having, you know, obviously being creative to, to find those undervalued deals. But I mean, the, the timing of that is just, you, you got to obviously meet with the right owner at the right time and then right. you know, keep them on your drip campaign to stay in touch with them. Right. What, um, so just let's unpack your business a little bit. And we can learn more about how people can find out about what you're doing. But if I understand this correctly, so you're, you're managing a fund that basically underwrites and evaluates different deals to partner with. Is, is that accurate or can you explain that? Yeah, we're pretty obsessed with finding the right operating partners. We're trying to follow the Buffett, Warren Buffett model, you know, he has 28 people on staff of the seventh largest public company in America, 28 people in the headquarters at least. And uh, so we're looking to partner with the very best operators in these recession resistant asset classes. And uh, we go through a pretty stringent due diligence process to bring them on board. And then we'll usually invest in everything that they have come down the pike for a while. Uh, sometimes we just pick and choose the deals. But uh, you know, we let them do the heavy lifting on the underwriting. We want to make sure that they've, you know, put a lot of their own skin in the game, that they have a track record, a team, technology, everything like that. And that was really my next question is how do you how do you vet them? But I think you went through, you know, pretty high level and, and a lot of it is track record, I think. Right. Yeah, we have a 27 step vetting process. And um, I mean, if somebody wants to see how to vet, it, you know, something like this, they can either, you know, come to our website and get our list of you know, our vetting, uh, you know, our due diligence list, or they can go buy Brian Burke's book, The Hands-Off Investor, which gives much more detail than we have. Yeah. When you're looking at these ones, because I mean, I've heard of Beeville, Texas, since I live in Texas, but I wouldn't think that that would be a great place for storage because like you said, 12,000 people. Um, how do you, I mean, I know we just talked about vetting, but how does one go about and say, you know, this 
is a good place for storage. This isn't a good place for storage. You know, if you've got a place that yeah. has, like you were saying, 80% occupancy, well, maybe it's because it's just a bad place for mm -hmm. um, self storage. You know, you can't, you know, 90% might be the average, but yeah. maybe this place is bad. So, how do you determine whether it's a good or a bad place for, you know, self storage or an RV park or anything yeah. like that? Yeah. So, let's take self storage. Uh, you draw a circle around the location. Uh, in a typical average suburban area, you might draw a three mile circle around it uh, with a you know three mile radius. and then you would check the population, the full the total population in that area, and also check the total number of square feet of self storage, including your own. And you divide that and you're looking for an average population, uh, you know, square foot to person ratio of seven or eight square feet as the national average. If you're much lower than that, that's likely a good location. Places like Florida, Texas, and California that don't have a lot of attic and basement storage can go much higher than seven or eight square feet. Places like Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana might have a lower ratio. Um, and they would also be places that would, on average, maybe have less toys, less stuff. And um, so, um, so that's what we do. We, we use a tool called Radius Plus. Radius Plus is a software that allows that, you know, for a pretty reasonable price, we'll do that analysis for you. You're also looking for a highly traveled road um, with high traffic count with a great visibility on A plus visibility on that road. And you're looking for a medium to high income area. It doesn't have to be real high, but at least medium. Okay. Fair enough. And what what is about, the, oh, oh, go, go ahead, ahead, Adam. Oh, and just touch real quick on kind of the, the mobile home, kind of what's the, the big thing you want to look for there. You know, it's kind of funny. It's, it's just, it's, if that sounded scientific, this will sound so unscientific. <laughs> we want to be within five miles of a super Walmart in a town of 5,000 or more. Uh, and there's, uh, and we want to be on public water and public sewer. That would be about it. <laughs> no, I think, and actually, I think you did a great job of breaking down, not, not going to like high level, but just like, here's some concrete criteria that we look at for, for yeah. both of those, even self storage. I mean, that's, those are key points. I love the point you made about, um, the, the location geographically and, and how the houses are built. Cause yeah, you want to think about that with, with basement and attic storage. Like you just need more places to put your stuff. I mean, what does a lease look like on, on self storage? I, I think surely most people have probably used self storage, um, at some point in time, but you typically, you sign people up, um, and this is going back to, you know, maybe the yeah. operational side of things, but uh, just out of curiosity, yeah. you get people on a year lease and what other like value adds are there on the leasing side? Yeah. The, um, so on the leasing side, the, the, some of the value adds would be adding tenant insurance, which we might, you know, as an operator, get half of the, you know, a 50% commission on that, for example. Um, another one would be, you know, upgrading the, you know, Hey, would you like to get a corner unit? Would you like to be on the main floor? Would you like to go from a 10 by 10 to a 10, 15, 10 by 15? That'd be some of the value adds. Um, all of the self storage leases that I'm aware of ever have, are month to month, which is a great opportunity to capture inflation. Yeah. That's, that's how you get point. that to uh, 18% in a month, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Nice. Oh, this is very cool. So, Paul, if uh, if people want to learn more about kind of you know participating, I mean, and maybe just give a, a quick pitch on um, your organization and uh, you know the benefits of of working with you and how people can potentially learn more about you and invest with you. Yeah, thanks. So, a lot of our investors uh, have you know decided that they are too busy with their job or their retirement or their family or all of the above to you know be hands on and they want to uh, pass you know they want to passively invest and they're looking for somebody to invest with well we're you know we do due diligence and find the very best of the best operators that we can find to protect the downside provide income and equity growth in these different arenas um, if they want to get hold of us they can go to wellings w e l l i n g s wellingscapital.com and if they'd like a free special report on these different asset classes or just investing in commercial real estate in general, it's wellingscapital.com forward slash resources. Yep. And don't forget his, uh, his latest book, The Storing Up Profits, Capitalize on America's Obsession with Stuff by Investing in Self-Storage. So, Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. 
to all our listeners. You can check out what we do at renttoretirement.com. That's renttoretirement.com. We really appreciate you leaving a review on our whatever podcast platform you use. And if you have any questions, send them on over to podcasts at renttoretirement.com. That's podcasts at renttoretirement.com. And we'll talk to you on the next episode. Thanks for watching the Rent to Retirement YouTube channel. Check out some of our other videos like this one or this one here.